Ave Maria. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Watch, for you do not know at what hour your Lord will come. But of this be assured, that if the householder had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would certainly have watched, and not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, because at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. Who do you think is the faithful and prudent servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food in due time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, shall find so doing. Amen, I say to you, he will set him over all his goods. Saint Anthony Mary, Maria Claret, whose feast we celebrate today, was born at the beginning of the 19th century. He was the fifth of 11 children, his father being a textile manufacturer. He was born in not far from Barcelona. And at the age of 12, his father sent him to study textiles. So he would become a weaver and so provide for himself and his family in due course. And so he spent some seven years on from the age of 12 till about just before 20, studying weaving. And being of a academic disposition, he also studied uh, Latin and uh, French and Catalan, which he, which he spoke fluently. So he was self-taught. And he also spent time looking, caring for the needy people you know, who, who came with him in spare. But at the age of 20, he realized that he was becoming addicted to his work, weaving, and that his, it, he was fearful it would lead him um, it, uh, away from God. And he decided to become a Carthusian, which is one of the strictest orders in the church. But ill health prevented him. He was not accepted. So returning home, he then de decided that he would become a priest, which he did. So he spent six years studying, and after his studies, he was given a benefice, a, a little parish in his um, home village, where he continued his studies, in particular theology. And all of this, he had a, a great devotion to Our Lady, and to her rosary, and to the Blessed Sacrament. After doing this for some time, he felt the need to, to pursue a missionary life because he, he recognized that people were ignorant of Christ and that something had to be done. And I remember we're talking about uh, in the 1840s and 50s in, in Spain, in fact in most of Europe, there was a great social turmoil. The revolutions, for instance, in 18. Um, 48 had disturbed all the countries of Europe with the exception of England and Spain was not exempt from this so there were the Carlist Wars and so on and he the, the people themselves were suffering not only from social deprivation but spiritual deprivation as well which is far more serious and so he began a, a missionary lifestyle recognizing that he wanted to be a missionary, he decided to join the Jesuits, the, one of the greatest missionary orders at the time. And so he went off to Rome and they rejected him because of ill health. So he came back and he decided, well, he would do the missionary work where he could. And so he began the, the, the series of missions. And he, wherever he went, he always went on foot, he walked. And so he managed to catechize vast regions of uh, Catalonia uh, and parts of Spain, um, just preaching. And he made such an impact on the people that the conversions were, um, were, were, were striking, to put it mildly. But in addition to this, he also spent time in the confessional. 
and he had the gift, it was discovered, of reading hearts, of reading souls. So this, in fact, only increased the number of people who, who came um, to him. And in addition to this, he was given other spiritual um, gifts, charisma, such as levitation, so that people, when he was preaching, he would be so wrapped up, they would see him elevate some six feet in the air. His aim grew because he also had a, a love and a care for the poor. And again, he would go to the poor, wherever they were, and spend time with them. And, and all, should also mention all of this, he was continually writing. In fact, at the end of his life, he had written 144 books. And he lived just 60 years. He died in 1870. So his, he, he didn't spend any time idle, but always found something to do. It, because of his, his, his work, he made enemies, especially among uh, um, the Freemasons. And the uprisings, he was one of the targets. So he was sent off to the Canary Islands, where he spent 15 months again preaching and bringing about the conversion. The queen, it, he came to the attention of the queen, Isabella II. And she asked for the Pope to to send him to Santiago in Cuba as Archbishop, because Cuba at that time was in spiritual, complete spiritual turmoil. And so he, in 1850, he was consecrated bishop and went to Cuba and to find turmoil, because apart from the coming to the end of the slavery, uh, the period of slavery, there were the poor, there were the mulattoes, there were the um, landowners, a very powerful group, there were the Freemasons, and so on. So he set himself to do two things. First, the reform of the seminary and of the clergy. And this is where it always has to begin, with, this, with the formation of the clergy. And secondly, he visited his diocese. So in the... Um, Ten years, less than 10 years he spent there, he managed to visit the whole of Cuba, visiting every parish three times. In, in the, and, and Cuba is not exactly a small island, but he spent time doing this. His concern for the poor was intense, and he was aware of the stratification in the this, this society and the, the um, oppression of the poor. There were the large um, landowners who insisted on a single crop, and so he began by saying to the, to the poor people, no, the first thing you have to do is to look after your own land. And you grow the crops you're best suited for. And he said, do not go into the single crop because you'll be trapped there. And so the, the people started to form communities where they would farm their own land and produce their own crops, enough food for themselves and for the market. Of course what would happen? The landowners regarded him as a deadly enemy. And an assassination attempt was made on him. In fact, there, there were several, but one in particular, where he was stabbed in the jaw. But he also established schools. Many of the schools in, in Cuba today are his foundation. He established hospitals. And he had libraries. He, 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 he put libraries for the poor. And he taught the, the children in particular to read because he regarded education as the way in which the, those social problems could be resolved. And the education wasn't directed towards um, the academia. It was practical, namely how to live a, a Christian life. And secondly, how to, he, he wrote books on agriculture. He studied it himself, and then he was able to write books so that people themselves could understand. And the, the, the enemy, his enemies pressed on him, but so that his life was in constant danger. And so he was sent back to Spain. Or rather, the queen asked, hearing about him, the queen asked for him to return to Spain to be her personal chaplain. And it was in uh, a royal command. But he, made, he bargained with her. He said, one, he would not live in the palace. Two, he would not be obliged to follow the, the courtly um, protocols. And he chose to live among the poor in, um, 
in a, a small house by himself, taking care, as always, of the poor who came to him. When it, um, he was known also for many miracles, which began in the Canary Islands and in Cuba and later in Spain such that it was seen to be walking on the water. And the, in, when he was in Cuba, the, several times there was, it was, the island was struck by terrible uh, earthquakes. And it was, he was seen to fall on his knees and to hold the press on the earth, and the earthquake would stop. And this happened twice, at least uh, twi two occasions where there were witnesses to it. And of course, for the hurricanes, whenever, the, the storms were brewing, you go out looking to the sky and bless the clouds and the hurricanes would dissipate. So here, here then is a man who was so close to God and so convinced of the power of Christ that as our Lord himself had promised, even nature would obey. He says, you will do even greater things than I myself have done because it is the power of Christ who is working in him. And so going back to Spain, he, he was a chaplain um, to the Queen until the re revolution occurred and he went off to, with the, into exile with the Queen because his life again was, was threatened and he, re he retired in Paris where he continued his work preaching, ministering to the poor and, <clears throat> and um, hearing confessions. 1870 came and of course it was the the year of the First Vatican Council, which he attended. And he was a strong believer and promoter of papal infallibility. And once this was pronounced, then the war against the church intensified. And um, the, the, the Pope, the, the, Rome, the, the, the papal states were seized, and the Pope was a prisoner in, in the Vatican. He was also a mystic, and he had several visions. Um, in, in 1859, in September, early September, the 30th of September, he, was, he had the vision of our Lord and our, our Blessed Lady, in which they warned him of the great evils that were to come. Now, this is 1859, just 20 years before the Vatican Council, and, of course, all that would follow from it. Our Lord warned him of the three great evils that the modern world would be facing. The first, he says, is that within the next century, there will be a series of wars so devastating that the world will no longer be recognized as the same. So we have, 20 years later, the Franco-Prussian War, then followed by the Boer War, followed by the First World War, the Second World War, and all the wars right up to the present. The Lord said specifically a series of wars. The second was, he said, four very powerful demons will be freed from hell, namely the demon of pleasure. Second, the, um, the, the demon um, of false reasoning. And then there will be the, um, the demon of, of um, of, of uh, sexual sins and lastly he said the, the demon who destroys fear of God and we can see exactly that this is what we are currently encountering, encountering. and then the, the, the second thing is the, the Lord warned him that the greatest enemy the church would face would be communism which was less than 10 years old at the time. We're talking about 1859. Karl Marx would, would write Das Kapital um, two, two years later in 1862. You know, so already the, the stage was being set. But the Lord never leaves us without warnings of what is to come so that we can prepare ourselves for it. So having revealed this to him, he said to him, the solution to this is devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and to the Rosary. And so St. Anthony Mary Claret promoted both of these, especially through his numerous um, congregations that he has established, especially the Claretitians who today 
of some 450 houses in all five continents with over 3,000 members. And they continued the same work that he had done. So then when the Lord um, asks the question, as we heard in the Gospel, who do you think is a faithful and prudent servant whom his master set over his household to give them their food in due time? He's asking a question, which we can interpret the answer to be, there'll be very few. Who do you think is? And two things are required from a servant, fidelity and prudence. Not one or other, but both. Because one can be faithful, but imprudent. That is, to be faithful means to follow, to follow the instructions of the Lord, of one's master, to be, to, be, to be concerned about what belongs to him, to make him the object of all of one's activity. So this is contrary, of course, to the shepherd who are not concerned about the sheep, but only about themselves. They feed themselves and have no concern with the sheep. So fidelity is first. But prudence is also important because if a thing is not done with the, in the, the most efficient way to achieve the end, it is sometimes ruined. In fact, oftentimes ruined. So with, <clears throat> with prudence, one chooses the best means to achieve the end. And in this case, St. Anthony Mary Claret had both. For his objective was always to give glory to God. So the hospitals he founded, the libraries he founded, in fact, the library in Barcelona was founded by him. And it's one of the largest libraries today in, in the city. He, all of this was done for the glory of God and also to save souls. That was his ob objective. And so, being faithful and prudent, he achieved a great deal in the 62 years of life God had given him. It is one of the sad things that his life is not as well known as it should be. As a promoter, as a defender, as a supporter of papal infallibility, he had in mind this, the, the structure, the condition of the church. Because for the previous 200 years, there had been a even more than that, perhaps uh, 400 years from 14th century, there had been this push um, for a conciliar church, a synodial church. That is, that we can, uh, the truth can be arrived at by um, a, in a democratic manner. So you have the bishops who would themselves meet in, in synod, in council, they would discuss the problems, whether social or theological. They would vote, and they would arrive, they think, at the truth, rather than a hierarchical church which our Lord had established. You are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, look after my sheep. This is the instruction God gave, Christ gave, to Peter, so that the church uh, is hierarchical. So we have the, the conciliar um, movement for many, many centuries saying that the, the, the bishops have greater authority or equal authority with the Pope. And there has been a constant pushback by the Popes against this, particularly Pius, Pius VI and Pius VII. But it, the movement had been increasing. And this is why it was so important at the Vatican Council the papal infallibility be firmly established. That done, immediately the Franco-Prussian War began and um, the, the church itself, uh, the attempt was made to, to suppress it. But today, that's, the movement has again resurfaced and we have the synod, which again the motion is, we can arrive at the truth democratically, where we can see easily what's going to happen in our own time if such becomes the the, um, the rule of faith, which of course it cannot, because the, the Christ has given us a constitution which is immovable. So even if the bishops desire to have this equality with the Pope, even though it's a community, it cannot work. It will certainly fail. We know this from Scripture itself. As Gamaliel said, if this movement is from God, then it is folly to resist. If it's from man, it will fail. And we can be certain that 
the Holy Spirit will never abandon the church, nor will Christ who promised us to be with us until the end of time. But what we can do is to ask the Lord, ask the Good Shepherd, to send us bishops according to his own heart, to send us bishops of the caliber of Saint Anthony Mary Claret. And in this we know that we will be secure and safe within the one sheepfold of Christ, the Catholic Church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.